The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. I gave you a moment of silence to believe a priest to make confession of sin as, as our, our premise to Bible study, because you can't study in carnality. A confession of sin, it could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue or vert sins. And they need to be confessed according to 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, here's what God is faithful about. He is faithful to forgive and to cleanse and to restore us into that complete fellowship with him that's been broken by personal sin that's now confessed and now you're restored because of the blood of Christ is faithfully working in our life. And so, Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way, both by automobile and by Internet. We pray that they would uh, do the preliminaries to classroom etiquette, at least what we require, because we want the maximum out of the hour of study into their lives. So encourage their hearts tonight, especially, Father, tonight as we close this prayer. I pray for the Russell family as uh, they suffer bereavement, a loss of a son, uh, a brother, a uh, a brother and a son. And so we lift them before you, Father. In Jesus' name, do a healing work in them. Send people, Father, that have the gift of mercy and, and encouragement and such as that into their life, uh, the, right, the right teachers of the word of God that understand grace and death and the joy that comes from knowing and being a member of the family of God. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we go. So... Here we have the Old Covenant right here, the Old Covenant under shadow Christology. It sends messages to heaven, writer says. <laughs> These things here are copies. These are types of a prototype that's in the master plan of God. Here's the master plan of God. And seat, seated up on the throne is God the Father. And when the right time comes, God the Father is going to send the Son, and heaven is going to come down. Now we're going to have, we're going to have the substance of the shadow is going to be on earth. The, this here is going to come to earth. Okay? So this is what the writer is talking about. Notice that the word here, cleansed and everything, is talking, everything, everything is about heaven. On the one hand, the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these. That's the point. And it's all about the master plan of God that says uh, God is not willing that any perish. And so the system of, of Christ is going to die on a cross and be buried and raised from the dead. This pointed to that prophetically. It pointed to it. And this is what the master plan is calling for. At a right time in human history, God is going to send his, his son, who is going to be called Jesus Christ, called Christ on this side, and identified as Jesus Christ by birth over here. He's going to come, and heaven's going to come down, etc., and then go back up. So that's, that's kind of what the writer is saying. But on the other hand, the heavenly things, with better sacrifices than these, so we're, we're, this is where we're going with our subject matter tonight. What is interesting about this word, therefore, it's un, it's used at an inferent, this point one, used as an inferential conjunction, but here's how it's attached. It is attached, the word un here as an inferent, it does, not every un is inferential, but this one is. It's inferring something. And it is a trailer hitch, the word un, uh, O-U-N. It's attached to something back and attached to something in. This makes this inferential. It's, it's, inf it's inferring or as a reference point to something that's been in discussion. Listen to me. Something that's been in discussion in, previ in, discussion in previous verses, which would pick you up 11 through 22, we're at 23. You go back to verses 11 through 23, and the subject, the main subject, which is the blood of Christ, by the way, is attached to this. So the idea, the subject matter of 11 through 23 
is the sub, which goes all the way back to chapter 8, but un there, and so it's att attached to something back there that's being brought forward and is attached to something inside this verse. It's attached to something. And so there's an attachment on a subject matter. The subject matter that's being discussed in real time is now being connected here in verse 33 to something that's internal. It's called an inferential conjunction. And it's really important. Sometimes it's always doing something like that. Sometimes it's just connected to something previously that's being continued but what broke it down that you and I don't understand are chapters and verses. They didn't have it originally. So the subject matter is just continuing. And the writer is now saying to you, this un here, remember, remember now the last time we met, we were talking about such and such and such. We're picking that subject up now. That's what they're saying with un. Except this is an inferential that also picks up a point <coughs> that they're now going to make some clarity on about the blood of Christ. Are you with me? Okay. Th this is why this, this little one little verse becomes kind of unique. And the word that's connected to it, that's connected to the word blood, the blood of Christ, the blood over here, the blood of calves and stuff, th this supersedes that. This was a copy here. This is what it's about. And at the right point in human history, when this one is established on the earth, then this one's going to come. Then the blood of Christ is actually going to come out of heaven, is actually going to come and die on a hill, right, on a cross to complete this that was over here. Okay. And so the writer, the, the, the connection of the blood that's brought here is in the verb. This inferential is looking if there is nothing verbally here that attaches it to that, then it's just a trailer hitch going that way. If, however, there is a subject within that structure of that sentence that is attached to this blood, then you carry it over into that, and it's the word cleansed. It is the word cleansed. That, that's the only verbal structure, and this is a present passive infinitive, and this infinitive is a verbal noun. Therefore, used in an inferential conjunction attached to the main verb, actually, this is not what we actually technically call a main verb, but it's the only verb in the sentence. And this is an infinitive, and, it's, and it works as a verbal noun. And those in Greek class know that. <clears throat> okay, and, and the rest of us learn it. So we have this word, it's a pre the, the word uh, cleansed. It's a present passive infinitive. It's the only verb in 923. It's the only verb in this completed sentence, which is also attached to what's pre previously studied. If you go back and look at verses 11 and 12, go back and look at verses 11 and 12. We're talking about Hebrews. Let's just go back and put our eyes on it a moment. Go back to Hebrews. Because the subject matter is now going to be, is going to be brought. This is what Christ is going to bring to us that, uh, that the other was just the shadow of. The blood of the calves and such was just the shadow of. So we're in verse 11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. And not through blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all. And he's talking about he's talking about heaven. Jesus never went to the temple as a high priest. He never went into the inner sanctuary. Not one time. But he's not wasn't permitted there. He was of the tribe of Judah, not the tribe of Levi. <clears throat> so, uh, and and he entered the holy place. He came down from the holy place and he re-entered the holy place, talking about heaven, uh, having obtained, look at this, eternal redemption. 
Listen, what, what the Old Testament and all these camps said, well, when the Savior comes, eternal reality. This, this is year to year to year to year. It doesn't mean you weren't saved forever. It just means that's how you had to identify it year to year. One of these years, this is going to come back. And when it comes back, this is not going to be uh, redemption that has to be discussed. I'm not talking about believing it, but it has to be discussed year by year by year until the Messiah comes. Do you understand that? When the Messiah comes, then it's going to wind up eternal redemption. I mean, one death, one time, it's done. See, that, that's, what the writer, that's what the writer is talking about. Then he goes on with this subject matter in verse 13, and he talks about, look at the word in verse 13, cleansing. See the word? Verse 13, he says, For if the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of, he of heifer sprinkling, those who have been defiled, sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more the blood of Christ through the will be offered, watch this, without blemish, notice the word again, to cleanse your conscience. See, the word cleanse is identified over here out of, the, out of, the, out of shadow Christology into historical Christology when Christ comes. Are you, are, are, do you understand that? In other words, that all of this stuff over here uh, that was the message, the prophetic message of redemption is now going to be completed when he comes and completes it, fulfills it. And, 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 and so this little, this little word, therefore, becomes pretty, pretty dynamic when you understand it's an inferential conjunction. It's attached to something that's been in discussion that's now been brought out in this, and so it's attached to that verbal idea and there's the word cleanse you understand that and that word therefore says hunt for that that inferential conjunction says to me as a pastor who understands the greek language listen there's something really exciting here don't want you to miss it because what we've been talking about is how the blood of the goats didn't complete f cleanse eternally you understand until the Messiah comes. When the Messiah comes all those believers that were over here in redemption are brought into an eternal redemption program isn't that interesting? The work of Christ on there, does every bit, are they saved? Of course they are. But listen, their, their fulfillment of that doesn't come until the Messiah comes into the world. We now, when we enter the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we believe that he died for our sins, we're and raised from the dead, we step right into this eternal redemption that they had to wait for Christ to come to get. Do you understand that? It's an eternal redemption. Look at, look at, what's that? Isn't that the word in verse 15 here? Uh, well, that's the internal inheritance. What was verse 13? We had, where'd we have eternal redemption? Well, anyhow, 12. Eternal redemption, now internal, uh, uh, the eternal redemption, eternal inheritance, eternal salvation, yada, yada, yada. In fact, we say it a different way. Under this, all this idea of eternal redemption, eternal, re you know what we call it? We call it eternal life. It covers the whole shoot match. Who would have ever believed that I was all in that little dinky word called un? Un. And, and so it's a little powerful word in, in this structure uh, to identify, listen, what, what's the subject of the whole chapters 8, 9, and 10? What is the primary subject we're talking about? The superiority of the new covenant. And we've been taking this whole thing apart. Uh, uh, superior priesthood, a superior redemption, a superior inheritance. Everything that we have in the new covenant is superior to anything they had in the old covenant because we're in the fulfillment of that whole ballgame. Right, right. So, so that's, 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 that's what he's talking about in this passage of scripture for us. Okay. That, he's talking about the superiority. Now in this passage, the superiority of the what? Cleansing. From what to what? See, right. That, that's a, that's important for us tonight because the writer said, do not miss what I'm about this. He said, this is the superiority of cleansing. Cleansing was everything under the old covenant. P purification under the old covenant was everything. But it is under the new covenant, but it falls under redemption. I mean, when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you get this whole package of 50 things. Part of the 50 things is called cleansing. 
If he was to open up that little pack and says 50 things you can never lose in time and eternity, you would see that the nine works of the Eucharist cup that deals with the blood of Christ, one of those nine factors that the blood of Christ does for us that's important every time we, we toast the cup to the Lord, right, uh, the Eucharist cup, is the word cleansing. Every one of those nine factors deal with the blood of Christ and what it secures for us. Redemption, reconciliation. Don the other day uh, in his prayer nailed all, all nine of them. But if you study the blood of Christ, you will wind up with these nine things. One of those nine is called cleansing. And how important is that? Well, I'll tell you how important this little idea of cleansing is. It's in 1 John 1, 9. This word cleansing is in 1 John 1, 9. And it's dealing with the blood of Christ working on our behalf after we're saved. There's a work before we're sa- There's a work in our salvation and a work of cleansing after we're saved. It's called 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's fa- sins, sins. He's talking about personal sins, mental attitudes, sins, sins of the tongue of earth, sins. This same cleansing that Christ did on the cross that brought me into redemption is still working my re- redemption out until the day of redemption. You understand? But I'm in the eternal redemption. When I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, I stepped into eternal redemption. And yet I'm waiting for the day of redemption, right? Ephesians, listen, Ephesians 4.30. Sealed unto the day of redemption. We're talking about our body, not our soul. Well, so we have this word, kata arzeo, that means cleanse from the blemish of the imp- imputated sin. That's Adam's sin or the inherent sin. That's the power of the sin nature that's broken or individual sin, personal sin. The cleansing, of, the cleansing of the blood of Christ works all three categories absolutely, magnificently, perfectly. Positionally. Positionally. Okay. Like, like, here's, here's one that's important. This is one of the things that got fulfilled with Christ coming and dying on the cross that, that, that's wonderful in regard to having a sacrifice every year, same sacrifice every year for the atonement of sin. Here's what we have in First Peter. It had to be, listen, that Jesus, when he dies, he has to die covenant blood. His life has got to produce covenant blood. When he goes to the cross, he gives up his life. What, is giving, what he's giving up is covenant blood. He's got to die a lamb without blemish and spot. No birth defects, no growth defects. And here it is. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19. Here's what he says. And listen, he did. Here, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like gold or silver or futile ways of life inherited from your forefathers. In other words, it's not... You didn't get it because your uh, 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 ancestor was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob or anybody else. And don't think that so, some way you can be re- redeemed by some, fu- listen, futile way, empty, empty way. But the precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished. You know when he was blemished? You know when the, when the lamb, unblemished, got blemished? See, when he says unblemished, he has he don't qualify to go to the cross unless he's unblemished. On the cross, he becomes blemished so that we become unblemished. What did it cost you? Nothing. Absolutely. Oh, you say, Ron, I had to give up. No. Mm-mm. Well, I had to walk. Mm-mm. I had, mm-mm, uh-uh, mm-mm. What you had to do is believe. Non-meritorious thinking towards God, you had to believe. The moment you believe the work of Christ works absolutely 100% in your favor. <laughs> it don't get better than that, buddy. If it gets better than that, I don't know. I can't stand as it is. The precious blood is a lamb unblemished and spotless. That We call that impeccable. He who knew no sin became sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the right, be, might be made the righteousness of God in him. Might be made. You're not made righteous because you sing do Lord all day long. You walk in the spirit. Well, anyhow. Now, it's okay to sing do Lord all day long if you want to, but do it, don't do it to prime God's pump, right? Don't do your good works to prime God. Do them because God's already primed your pump. Uh, here's the second thing. It's the word necessity or the word necessary. 
in the Bible, the English try like they're trying to have smooth translation for it when you're reading it. But there is no it was. But there is the word necessary. Anageke is a one Greek word, is nominative singular masculine, and is used as a predicate nominative. A predicate nominative. In specific connection, it's used in specific connection with the verb cleansing. Remember, listen to me now, the verb cleansing is a verbal noun. It's an infinitive. Okay? Showing, and it's going to show as an infinitive of a verbal noun, it's either going to show one of two things. It's either going to show purpose or result. Purpose or result. It's used as a predicate nominative because it's connected to a verb that's an infinitive, which is a verbal noun. And so this word is, is we would translate, of necessity. It was necessary. It is necessary. It's of the utmost importance. I don't know how you up this thing, but we all have a way of upping the importance of something like that. It's necessary. It's uh, imperative, we might say, to make a stronger way of saying it. This is what this means. Um, a predicate nominative. It is connected to the verbal, verbal, which is a verbal, uh, it's an infinitive, uh, connected to the word cleansing, which is used as, a, it's used with, uh, <laughs> yeah, I know, please stay with me. It's connected with Mende. A comparison on the one hand on the other hand that's a comparison isn't it on the one hand on the other hand now what we're having here is a setup the writer is showing you the necessity of shadow of shadow the necessity of shadow crystallic what was the purpose everybody goes up well, what's the purpose of all that stuff i felt that way when i had to study it in my theology training the problem is nobody showed me what i'm showing you if they'd have showed me that first, I might have got excited about that. But they didn't show me all that. I went through all that, and I went, <laughs> yeah. They gave me a test like, what kind of a lamb and what kind of a goat? And, oh, jeez. What about if you didn't have I, I don't know. It's, a, it's all right. I'm just saying I would have liked to know where that thing was going to take me. They could have started with that, and I went, oh, yeah, show me all that. And, but anyhow, it's just... So I learned going through that. So what we have now is that these two things are attached. Remember the word necessity of shadow Christology. What's the, what was the purpose of it? What was the deal connected with heaven, right? The necessity of the cleansing, the superiority of the cleansing of the blood, right? That's what we're after. Okay. And so the writer, now what he does to show you this, he separates it with a Mende sequence. It's really important. Uh, I say it's important. I, you know, who knows? It's apparently, it's important to me. So, yeah, you know, it's up to you whether it's important to you. Uh, I don't know. But see, he, the Mende is a comparison uh, between shadow Christology of the Old Covenant. Watch out now, because this is what I drew uh, as I began with you. Remember this little thing I drew? We're trying to figure out here, because that's apex. We're trying to figure out. We got Old Covenant, we got Shadow Christology of Old Covenant, and over here we got Historical Christology, that's Jesus comes, he's coming, he's coming, Whoop. he's here, of, uh, of uh, new, new Covenant, Old Covenant, New Covenant. I always keep an eye on my wife, and she kind of gives me signals of, you might as well go ahead and wrap this up, and let's go home. <laughs> yeah, I think you're losing them, Ron. <laughs> oh, she's right, and I'm in good shape right now. She puts that down and starts giving me these signals, you know. Is I'm smart enough, I've been married long enough, smart enough to listen to him too. She goes like, I've sat here long enough, my, let's go home. I know, 
and I know y'all feel the same way. So. I, I know. Just put, just put it in the cup when it goes around. Uh, so, so look, look. Here's what we miss in the old covenant. All of this is pointing towards something. Listen, what does the law? What does the law point to? Christ. Galatians 3, it's on your paper. Galatians 3, 24, 25. The law always is a tutor pointing you to Christ. And then he says, and when he comes, you're no longer under a tutor. You're a, you, now you're under the tutor of the Holy Spirit, not a system. So that, that's really important. This was to point, and here, here, here's the master plan of God. Here's the master plan of God up here. And th- these are pointing to this because this is where he's going to come from. Jesus came down, and, okay, don't make me sing. Wouldn't take much, a couple of dollars, and I'd probably sing and tap at the same time. Um, and this is brought out, not really, it would take a whole lot more than that. <laughs> she, she ran, said, you got two dollars with you? Oh, see this? I ought to learn. I've been caught with that once before. I ought to learn not to do that. Um, now I'm at point three. Now the writer introduces the necessity of the comparison then day of the cleansing show the superiority between the shadow Christology of the old covenant to the historical Christology of the new covenant with the men on the one hand and the day that's a sequence idea on the other hand. And so that's very important. I, I hate it that they didn't put that in the English because it, 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 may, it helped when you say on the one hand, then on the other hand, because otherwise it's not very clear. But when you do that, and I don't know why they didn't, because the Greek requires it. And um, I mean, I wouldn't let one Greek student get through my class if he didn't put that down on paper and turn it in. Because it makes a big difference to me. And it's put there to make a big difference. So when men comes out, we have shadow Christology, the old covenant. For on the one hand, the copies the prototype, the copies, see, copies. You know, I go in and I give you copies, right? I keep the master copy and I give you copies. Well, see, the old covenant was copies of the master that was held in escrow. (laughs) God, God's got control of the master copy. Then he puts it down here, the master copy, he gives it to us, right? See, and that's this exactly. In the, even in the Greek language with a definite article, it means the same thing. Uh, so I thought the English translation, that was really good if you understand what a copy is. What, that's what, what they meant by uh, uh, a shadow. A shadow is not the substance. It's a reflection of the substance. Um, so the same Greek word, and, and I want you to turn in Hebrews with me, the same Greek word, copies, The same Greek word is used in the 8th chapter. We have probably forgot that by now. But it's in the 8th chapter in a dynamic duo of verses. In the 8th chapter, uh, verses what? 4 and 5. 4 and 5. Now, if he were on earth, talking about Jesus Christ, and talking about in the Old Covenant. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. Right? Because he's not from the tribe of Levi. He would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law. In other words, you had to be a Levite, who serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Who's got the master copy? God. It's the master plan. You know where that master plan came from, Don? Eternal Life Conference. Got that right. Oh, you, I tell you, you guys are so good students. You are so good. Oh, you have spoiled me rotten. Yeah, I'm telling you, you spoiled me rotten. I can't, like, go talk to anybody else anymore. I mean, because I have to explain so much to get to where I want to take them. I mean, that's all right, but they got to give me a week. They can't give me a day. I couldn't do it in a day anymore. Uh, but anyhow. But but th- these verses are dynamite, who serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things, just as, Mo- watch this now, Je- and I love this part, this how the old co- this how the old covenant came, just as Moses was warned by God 
when he was about to erect the tabernacle for this is what he said. See, he says that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown to you on the mountain. You know where that pattern came from? The pattern is the master copy. It's the type. Where did he get it? Moses down here? He, he, he got it higher on his mountain deal. Where'd he get that from? He, he got a piece of the master copy. He keeps the master because it's going to become, it's going to come into human history and fulfill this baby. This, this thing's going to be done. That's so good. That's so good. Jeez. That's so good. You have no idea how good that is. The same idea used in Hebrews, the 8th chapter, verses 4 and 5, is given to explain how the Levitical sacrificial system under the Mosaic law served as a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. Right? So when... When the right time in Galatians 4.4, 4, at the right time in human history, God sent forth his son, right? Born of a woman, born under the law to fulfill the law, et cetera, and et cetera. Isn't that good? I mean, this is so good. So good. To, listen, look, look for a moment since we're in chapter 8. Look at chapter 10 and verse 1 for a moment where we're headed in the future. I don't know when the future will be. Probably Christ will come back before we get there, but... That'd be okay, too, wouldn't it? Have you left a, a rapture will? You know, the will you got right now, if the rapture comes, won't, won't work. That won't work. I mean, if you, oh, your ear's gone, what are they going to do? Well, I know. Oh, the government will get it. Oh. Spare me. I don't want the government to have any more than I give them. Right? So you... You might leave it to an unbelieving heir to go like, well, and then tell them, listen, you, if you're going to see me and thank me, you better get saved between now and then. I'd like to have you thank me when you get here. For the law, since it has only a shadow. It, I've told you this before. Rick Hughes and I, we we needed a car for traveling. We we had met a guy in, out, out of Aniana at a, uh, a revival meeting somewhere or another. And he said, if you ever need a car, come see me. We need cars, so we wouldn't see him. Some things you don't never remit, you never lose, you never forget when you meet a guy. Well, we remember that. So we went up and talked to this guy up in Aniana. He had a Chevrolet Oldsmobile dealership. And and he was a wonderful guy and loved the Lord, and he really did us good. We got was able to put us in a new Oldsmobile. <laughs> and uh we, God always does something you don't deserve, doesn't he? We didn't do we a oh, model T or something out there in the back with <laughs> What we deserved. It was, but anyhow, we got ready. We had never had a chance to really talk to the guys because we met him in a, you know, passing kind of thing. If you ever see me, you know, he's a, tr a good businessman, you know, pushing his product and all that. Uh, but he was an, a good believer. He was a fine guy, believer. And so uh, when we got out of the car to go in, he said, Rick said, which one of you is going to talk and which one's going to pray? Because we could get this guy before we get out of here. And and so uh, I said, well, listen, I'll pray, and you take them. Because they both were big football. They had been football players out of Alabama, and I forget what this guy's name was now. But Rick, And Rick and him hit it right off. So I said, well, you take the lead, and I'll do the praying. We went in there, and he said, well, here's an automobile. Here's what I give you. And we had an old clunker to, to trade in, and, and he just gave us an unbelievable deal. And so Rick says to him, hey, hey look, got, we got a little contract, and we got to have a little bit of you know, we have to, you know, can I give you $5 a month for the rest of my life? And he goes like, yeah, I'll take it. So kind of thing. And um, Rick, Rick, Rick said, well, let me read the contract. <laughs> I thought to myself, read the contract? Neither one of us, but what, both of our heads together couldn't have figured out a contract. And I thought, well, what a, read the contract, sign it, and let's go. And are you going to share the gospel with this guy or not? And Rick says, uh, I forget what this guy's name was, but he said, Got a real error here. The guy went, no, let me see that thing. He looked at it. He said, well, I don't see anything wrong. Rick said, well, I can tell you right now, I don't have a rapture clause. <laughs> and, and the guy says, a what clause? He said, don't have a rapture clause. And he was off to the races. I mean, Rick got him really good with that rapture clause. And, and, uh, but he was already saved. <laughs> 
uh, it versed, anyhow, the law, since it was only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices year by year, which they offer continually, make perfect, make perfect those who draw near. Make perfect. Do you realize when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, that was the greatest day in your life for all eternity, the past, present, and future, you were made perfect positionally. You know why? Because the guy came down and fulfilled the whole perfect deal. That's it. Man, we're so privileged to live. Big guy, we're so privileged to live in the day and the nation and the time in which we live. Don't grumble about one day. Not one day. Listen, people, all these guys over here working on this deal, they'd have gave their right arm and maybe their left to be where we are. Is the old saying go? I, I never liked that saying, by the way. I've met a lot of things I would like, but I was never willing to give any part of my body up for it. So I don't know where that idea came from. Some one-armed guy, didn't he? Trying to get a club together. Everybody give up one arm and we can start a club. I don't know what that's about, but I never did like that idea, Pam. So, uh, listen, here's the point of this whole thing. You go like, what was being cleansed? And where was the cleansing working? Where, where, and what was working? See, and, and it's talking about heaven. It's talking about heaven. It's talking about heaven. He's talking about this over here in heaven. And, and what it is, it's God, and I don't know how that works, but God is working towards a point. In, now, listen, in human history for the first coming of Christ, God, God is in charge of that idea. God himself is in charge of that idea. And when the perfect timing on human history comes, boom, there, is he, there he is. The second advent is the same way. When he comes back a second time, it's going to be the same way, under the same program. He's going to wrap this whole thing up that we're in. I mean, that's just, and this whole thing is established right here, right? And it's all about the blood of Christ and the superiority of the, superiority of the cleansing work of the blood of Christ in the dispensation in which you and I live. That's Heaven was waiting for the Son of God to leave, to go to earth to fulfill the redemption program of the master plan of God. Heaven is waiting. The Son is sitting on eager, and he has to wait till the Father says, all right, Son, it's time to go. He comes to earth. He fulfills his mission. Where does he do? He goes back. This time, he's not sitting at the, at the foot of the throne. He's sitting on the throne, isn't he? And yet the Father will tell him when to come back. That's amazing stuff right there. You ought to read. I've, I left you some passages. John, the third chapter, John, the sixth chapter. That John 6, you ought to circle that. That John 6, 38 through 40 is well worth reading on your own time. All right. Point number four. Now the writer shows the superior, superiority of the historical Christology of the new covenant by the word day sequence. He says, but on the other hand, the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. What the writer is trying to tell us is the fulfillment of the shadow Christology of the old covenant was by the blood of Jesus Christ, i.e. the cross, his blood for our sins, buried and raised from the dead the third day, is our justification. And that's superior to anything that's ever been. You can read about that in Romans, the third chapter, 23 through 26. It's a dynamite passage, and... Uh, I thought that Ernie did a good job on that on Sunday. He nailed that thing down really well. I had to think about him as I prepared with this. Now look at the bottom of the page, what we've learned so far from the seventh chapter, the eighth chapter, and up to where we are right now in verse 23. The better sacrifices was our subject today. It's one of the nine listed so far that we've studied. The new, the new covenant betters that every church age believer gets because of the grace of God. He has a better hope. In, in Hebrews 9, uh, 7, 19, he's in a better covenant. Uh, 7th chapter 22, 8th chapter verse 6. Better promises. Chapter 8 of Hebrews 6 and 7. Better ministry. Chapter 8, verse 6, 9th chapter, verse 14. 
a better blood. Ninth chapter, verses 12 through 15, uh, verse 14. A better redemption, a better redemption, 9, 12. By that, it's eternal now. It's, it's not annual, it's permanent. Uh, better, better mediator. Now we have 915, a better mediator. Of, we have a better mediator of a better covenant with better promises, yada, yada, yada. And then we have a better inheritance. This is what we've learned so far. We've gone from, well, we picked up a little bit out of seven, but primarily we were in chapter eight, uh, nine, and 10, and we haven't even looked at 10 yet. We're, we're the people that have it, quote, better. Can you remember that? We're the people of all of biblical history who have it better than the people behind us. And by the way, better off than the people who are going to be ahead of us. Okay? We, we, we are always in a better day, a better situation in our life, and we ought to remember it. When we think things aren't going well, listen, they're going better than, they're going better than you could imagine. They're going better. You don't have bad days. You have better ones. Now, what you, what you choose to do with a better day, he's given us a better day. We live in a better time, a better day, and a better system, a better everything. What you do with that's up to you. But it is better. Not bitter, better. So, uh, let's close a word of prayer and we'll let the internet people go back to television or whatever they do. Father, we're thankful for these that have come our way as we set in our opening. But now we've covered a passage. Uh, yeah, there's some technicalities in it, but look at that one verse. Who would have ever believed all of that was in there? And, and it's important that we understand that because we're so much better off since Christ came and died on the cross for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead. When we believe it, we're so much better off. We're so much better off. And we ought to always remember that. And where is your life tonight? Are you better off than you were yesterday? Are you better off than you were five years ago? Are you better off? How is it possible that you've been saved 10 years and you consider yourself worse off, not better off? Get, get in a Bible teaching church. Get your head stuck in the word of God. Listen to these truths. Believe these truths and walk them out in your life by faith. You will find that you're in a better life. You've been saved to live a better life. It's a grace life. You walk it out by faith. You walk it out because faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. You walk by faith, not by sight. Quit, quit, quit looking to the world for your solutions to your problems. Look to, look to God. Well, Father, we pray that things that we've said today would have some impact upon those who have listened to us. If they don't remember anything or remember they're in a better time, a better situation, a better day because they're in a better salvation than anybody ever thought they could ever have. For we made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not counting our sins against us. He made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us.